this attached to it. Your subs need to know you're under this obligation and so are they because you hired them to help you perform your contract. Right? So that's the reason we put that in there. Everyone knows what's, you know, what they're responsible for and what they're going to be obligated to do. All right. Workers, we know about certified payrolls. They're required for all laborers and mechanics. Okay, workers on the job site. People who are doing manual labor. That leaves out, does not apply to the professionals. Alright. I have a surveyor out there. Do I need to see payrolls for that same surveyor? No. I have somebody <coughs> testing, uh, the, doing some QC, QC testing. Do I need to see payrolls for Bechtel? No. Alright. Do I need to see payrolls for, um, you know, uh, someone who's doing, um, what other things? Something else that's, that's professional, like um, reviewing, someone who's doing QA work for you, someone you bring in as, um, you know, that's helping with your contract. If they're professionals, architects, engineers, you don't need to see payrolls for that. Right. Some of your subs may not know that, they may supply them to you, and you tell them, no, you don't, you don't need to. They're not hourly wage earners. Usually those aren't, aren't hourly wage earners. So we don't require that. They don't fall under Davis Bacon requirements. I get thirsty a lot, so you're going to see me yell and do the what, Rubio thing or something or what's not here. Um, prevailing wage rates apply. All right, prevailing wage rates apply. These, you'll notice them, you're probably familiar with them. <coughs> They're pages and pages long. All right, usually there's at least three pages that have wages on there, different wage information. All right. They're specific to a county. I'm, I'm working in Volusia County, it's not going to be the same that you're going to find when you get down to Brevard or to Marion County. It's going to be a different, uh, different wage rates. Type, different types. There's highway, there's heavy, there's building, there's residential. There's different types of wage, prevailing wages that may apply to any of the contracts that you're under. Ten days before the bid letting, or the bid opening if you call it that, that's the one you know to pick, 10 days before. So if it's April and the last wage modification for this <coughs> county was done in January, that's the one I'm going to use, January. I'm not going to go back to 2015, I'm going to get to use January because it's at least 10 days before we let this project, before the bids were open, in other words. All right, award 90 days from the bid letting, that means you've got to use your current wage decision. If, if you open the bids in April, and then we don't, we don't award it until <coughs> December, I'm not going to use the same one that was in, I'm not going to use the same wage uh, rate that was in the contract. I've got to look for closer modification. It may have changed between then and now. If it hasn't, that's fine. But it may change, so you have to use the modification that's closest to the date of when it gets awarded, all right? So it may change. I may, some of my local agency jobs, some of them, you know, will sit around for a little while and, and then they finally award it. So we've got to make sure that we're using the correct modification to a wage, a prevailing wage, all right? If there's any questions, the one in charge is the district contract compliance manager. If you have a question about it, you can ask me, any of the RCSs, but they're going to have to check with the DCCF because that person has to uh, represent the state. If Patty Vickers, we know at the state office, if she says you're using the wrong wage rate, it's on him because he's the end all be all. Here's that title. All right, so we've got to make sure we're using the right one. We have to post it on the bulletin board. Again, got all the pages. We try and leave off those last two pages. It's just a bunch of words. We have to have them on there, don't we? And we have to include everything. You can include it in every subcontract if you want to. You should at least reference it, the wage rates, so that who you're hiring as a subcontractor understands and knows that they have to use those wages. It's good before a contract because what? What happens before they get out there? They have to know that every classification they intend to use is on that list, right? 
What happens? They get out there and we, we look around and we see somebody on a piece of equipment. Well, that's not on our wage rate table. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> every, every one. They have to have a chance to look it over. You're going to hire a sub. Make sure they look it over and say, hey, are there any um, classifications you see here that you, know, you can use? And of course, we're going to ask them to use them verbatim, exactly as they're listed there. If they don't find it, then maybe we need to get that classification question there in time. All right? For certified payrolls, we have to pay employees weekly. Right? Pay them at least a minimum of weekly. You can pay them daily like day laborers do, but you have to pay them at least weekly. All right? Certified payrolls are submitted. Weekly. The prime collects them, reviews, and submits them. We talked about that. The subcontractors have to turn them in no matter what their contract amount is. Again, you hire me for $2 today, I'm going to have to turn in a payroll. All right. Temporary agencies have to turn in payroll. Rental agreements with operators, that operator is on a payroll. <coughs> Yours or their own as a, as a prime contractor. All right. Then we have reporting rules. What do certified <coughs> payrolls do? Dennis taught us that earlier. What do they do? Right. They're due seven days after the payday. When's that? Because everybody's different, don't we know? Wouldn't we love to have it all uniform? You have to get paid on a Friday. You have to, you know. But we don't. Everybody chooses their own uh, what their week is. Tuesday. <coughs> Mine can start on a Tuesday and end on Monday. My company starts on a Saturday and ends on a Sunday. You know, it's all different. Everyone chooses different. So it doesn't matter what you choose, but it matters that the prime submits it or lets us know for itself and every sub. If I don't know when the pay date is, what did Dennis tell us he's going to use? What's he going to use? Yeah, he's going to have to use the date that you put on the top of your form. He's got to use that date. Of course, now that date, yeah, it could be it could be the date you're using, but by the time you get it to me, you get it to me five days later. Oh, you're late. Because look, there was a date. But if you give me the pay date, then I know it's within the time. Alright. So it's to your advantage as a prime contractor to know and subcontractors to get that information to your subs right away so that we can get it to the RCS. And they can set up their, their files and know exactly when, for your particular company, we should be seeing those payrolls. All right? Labor interviews, they talk a little bit about that for truckers. Labor interviews are part of the certified payroll system now because this is our um, way of conducting them by the administrative team. Um, it's, it's, a, it's for our benefit, obviously, to um, get a snapshot of what's going on out in the field. And so we are going to, it could be the inspector, the RCS, could be the PA, could be a senior so-and-so, it could be me walking into your project and saying, I need to do a labor review. Right. But they're, they're done by the administrative staff. Right. They're done on a monthly basis, a certain number. Is, the number that we have to do is based on contract dollar amount. You know, as pre it's mentioned, how many are going to get done every month. If you know that we've got to do five of them a month, then you've got, there's going to be five different people that are, at least, that are going to get interviewed during that month. Now remember, there's, there's consequences to that. All right? You interview somebody, you always learn something, don't you? Right, that's how, well, my first project, I, I interviewed someone, the first thing they said, I said, are you paid weekly? And they said, oh, I think bi-weekly. Oh, wrong. Wrong answer. <laughs> wrong answer, that wasn't right. And this company said, I've been doing this for years, what are you talking about? Someone's been reporting it weekly, but they're actually paying their people bi-weekly. All right? We find that out through a labor you may not, as a prime, even know that. Your sub may not, you know, they answer, yes, yes, I do this, yes, yes. And then what they're really doing may not be for this responsibility. So that's why we do labor interviews. We have to make sure, all right? We're going to do them on primes and all the subs. We're trying to get a, a 
a good, you know, mixture of all the different subs. So any of your subs out there could be subject to a labor interview at any time. Okay? On the certified payroll, we know there's two parts. What two parts? Who knows? Two parts to a certified payroll. There's a statement of compliance. Alright, let's see if I got it. Statement of compliance. Okay, what are some, some things we else we call that? That uh, statement of compliance. What do we call that in the real world? What does it contain? That's the signature page. That's got your signature on it. Alright. When we first got the law, we didn't have that. We didn't, nobody had to certify it. So then they came back and, oh, we need to make a law to certify it. All right, now, when you sign it, you are certifying it. When the prime signs that, when the sub signs that for their company, they are certifying it on the statement of compliance. It states, I am in compliance. I know the laws. I'm following the laws. Statement of pay record. That contains all the good stuff, doesn't it? That's the statement of pay record that's got all the information you need, all right? And you can use <coughs> the WH-347, which is, which is a form, let's see, here's one that looks like theirs. All right, you can use the Wage and Hour Division's form, 347 if you want to. You can use the DOT form, the 710-69, all right? You can use another format, but it's got to have that same information. Again, you can use your same. We see a lot of the, the firms using their, you know, computerized versions, and that's fine to use it. But you got to check it. You have to add that statement of compliance. Make sure it has everything, <coughs> every regulations listed, everything, and also the same information. If I use a form and it leaves off the, the column for classification, my RCS still catch that? So, hope so. You need to catch that because we have to show the classification. How else do we know what they're going to pay, right? right? So that's the reason sometimes you, you have to check your formats and make sure. If you, you can use your own, but just make sure. All right, here we are. We're busy hard work. Uh, yeah. That's not me, right? I'm a lovely cat, right? All right, the things that have to go on the pay record. You have to give a name, full name, first and last name, <coughs> and an ID. We call it a four-digit identifier. Um, some people use a three-digit because they choose not to use their um, you know, the social security, the last four digits of their social security. If you choose not to do that, again, you still have to have that social security on file for that employee, but you can use whatever identifier you want. I'm not going to turn it back if you give me a three-digit. Or our company uses, you know, W109, you know, or some other version. You just have to identify some sort of a numerical identifier. All right, the correct classification has to be on there. You know that the daily and the weekly number of hours that they work. <coughs> sure, we know that's got to be on there, right? How many hours? I work two hours on Wednesday. I work five hours on Thursday. And then I work twelve hours on Saturday. Oh, that's horrible. I've got to have that all down there the hourly rates of the wages paid, and the fringe benefits, all right? So what, it, what does that person pay per hour, and what did I pay them extra as fringe that I think should be added to their, their rate of pay, their cash pay, so that I can make up that, that minimum rate, all right? You also have to show your project growth, what they made on this project, those two hours, those seven hours, and then what they made all week long. They worked on four different projects. What's their total? All right. So when you're doing, you're going to do as a project, you're going to do your, your um, reporting for each of those projects. Each of those projects is going to have that same weekly gross wage line for that individual, that employee. Because this is what they earned gross for that week. And then all deductions are taken off of that gross. There's your deductions. There's, there's going to be columns for that. Actual or net wages paid. We have to show what they actually went home take home. What's the take home? All right. So when I'm interviewing somebody and they say, I'm not taking home very much. They're taking a lot out of my check. I don't know why. It's all week long and they're taking a lot out. And I look and I say, sure enough, they are. They're charging you $15 just to have a uniform. They're charging you this, charging you that. 
there are times when you find that the employee was right. They're not just griping. Other times, maybe they are right. Those are things you have to put on the, on the, the pay record. All right. Now, what happens when you make a cookie? Yeah, the reporting requirements are not all met on that form that you sent to me. You could be doing everything right. What you sent to me, you, you know, your five-year-old did it for me. You know, come on. Sometimes it looks that way. Sometimes we have a bad day, we don't send everything. Oh, my goodness, what did I do? I sent it, and it doesn't look right. That thing's off. <coughs> We're going to get a we are. We hate to do that. All right. You know why there's such a bother? Because we want you to have one. Maybe one, but never again. It's just so much of a hassle. You don't want to do it ever again. All right. If I made it easy, it's going to happen over and over and over. It's hard. It's hard on us to, to issue them. It's a laborious process because we've got to put it in every system so everybody can see. That's another thing. U.S. Primes, it's all track. How many violations did they get? You don't want any, though. You don't want any. Right, it's issued to the prime, even though your sub, three tiers down, did it. It's going to come to you. 20 days to resolve it? All right. You submit verifying documentation. Yes. We settled this claim. We did this. We did everything you asked. Here's what we did. If it's unresolved, what happens? What did we talk about earlier? You get no, <coughs> efficient notice goes out, pay to be with help. So we'll get past that. We don't want that, right? Nobody wants on the, on the deficiency status, right? It gets mentioned in the meetings. It gets put out in all the meeting minutes. It goes everywhere. Everyone is copied. Why is that? Everyone gets copied on the table. You know? But we, we've got to avoid that, all right? So here's the form. If I'm going to use the wage and hour division form, I know it's hard to see because I just it's just a big snapshot, but you can see what it looks like. It's got every column. If you, if you go through it, you'll see that everything's there. All right? What you want to notice is the form dates are shown in the upper right-hand corner. Just like on DOT, upper right-hand corner always. All right, always check to be sure you're using the latest form. Notice this one expires. 2818 now. The old one was 211. Right. So if you're if somebody turns in a sub turns into you something that's on a wage and hour division and it says 211, oh that's no form. Let's get you the latest one. Provide that to them. Use the latest form. Nobody wants to use an old form, but we just keep using them from you know, the, the project before and you know it, keep, it happens. So just kind of make make sure that you're watching that for all your subs and do out. Alright, this is what a statement of compliance looks like on the wage and hour division. It's got blue sections here. You can kind of see it's a little darker blue. You can kind of help us out. This is what you're supposed to fill in. Alright. And sometimes I think, oh, why do I need to know that? Of course I have to fill it in, but you know, sometimes it just all looks like a blur. So it is kind of helpful to have that highlighted area so that's what I'm supposed to fill in. And if when I get done filling it in, I can still see a lot of blue, then I haven't done something. So it's kind of helpful that way. Now, when we get to the, um, the DOT form, <coughs> we're not that helpful, sorry. <laughs> you guys know what to do here, people. It's a, it's, this one's an Excel spreadsheet, too. All right? So you, it, it can be an easy process for you to, if those of you who know Excel, and you want to use, use uh, uh, good and accurate on Excel, that's helpful. Um, once you get a template down, you're good to go. That's why we say the very first payroll that you do, that you submit, we're going to look at everything. We're going to look at every section. We're going to look at every employee. Right? We're not going to just, you know, oh, it looks good, put it away. That's not going to happen on the first one. Right? Because what happens if there's a mistake on the first one? And I don't catch it. You're, here you are, now you've got a violation for four weeks when really it's, you know, it's when you caught the first one. Right. I've been good to go after that. So we're trying to, you know, partner with you to make sure that we're reviewing in a good, you know, a good time so that we can uh, catch that and avoid those payroll violations. All right, this is what the statement of compliance looks like. <coughs> All right, notice it's got a date at the top. That's the same date when I'm doing this. I'm not putting it aside for five days and then I'm going to sign it. No. 
That's your signature date of when this is getting reported to the, the DOT. All right. If I make a change to this later, can I use the same form? What would I have to do to this form in order to resend it out again? Revise. Revise. I would have to change the date, right? Because now it's two weeks later, three weeks later. I can't use that same form. It's still good. Different date. Okay, so make sure. This is a certified document. This can go before a judge, okay? This is serious stuff here. As it says right in here, I don't want to, I'm not committing any fraud here. Alright? We have the date. Then the next part is the, the name of the, of the contractor, of the, of the person who's going to sign this, I'm saying, the, um, the person signing it, and then comes the date, uh, the title of what their title is. All right, can their title be, uh, the person who's doing this, can I be, um, you know, the receptionist they just hired yesterday? Why can't it? All right, because the next line says, let's see, I, Cheryl Catron, office receptions. Do you hereby state that I pay or supervise the payment of the persons employed by this company? Uh-oh. Do I do that? <laughs> I don't want to do that. I don't want that responsibility. I just got fired. All right. It needs to be an officer of, this, of your company or someone who supervises. All right. And is responsible for the numbers that follow, right? For all, everything that's on the pay record. I want to know something about it, that's for someone to talk to. All right. You as a prime, you're going to want to talk to that person in that person's company. All right. All right. Let's see if we can. All right. This is what the, the wage and hour record looks like on the DOT form. There's one difference. Who knows what the one difference is between the wage and hour division form of the, of the record, the pay record, and the DOT form? Who knows? There is a difference. All right. right here we ask for race. On the DOT form, we ask for race and gender. You don't have to put it in there, but it is there. If you want to give us that information, we appreciate it. Race and gender of the employees that are there. All right. On the wage and hour division, it's not a requirement, so therefore they don't even put a column in there. Right. But we do. Again, I'm not going to, there's no violation if you leave it off. We just as a, as a state, we want to encourage you to put that information on there. Right. And let's review the DOT's payroll form real quickly. We'll go through and we're going to start with the state of compliance. All right, that's called the signature page. And it certifies the payroll. Don't send me a pay record without that certification statement, okay? I've got to have that page because that certifies it. Right. Again, it's the same way like anything you do. Um, my child does, you know, does homework, okay? Comes home, does his homework real quickly, hands it to me. Okay, I'm not gonna review something that you just kind of halfway, you look it over first, you make sure everything's right, and then I'll look at it. Don't waste my time looking at something that's halfway done, right? So that's what we try and, try and do, is to make sure that if you're willing to certify it, then you've done everything you know to get it right. All right, the statement of compliance, this is what the top part looks like on that statement of compliance. We talked about the name, then it goes down to the contractor. I work for ABC Trucking, like she said there, we'll, we'll use that. I'm on the um, Volusia County Road Bridge, fancy time. It, it could be really long, couldn't it? Oh well, no, I've got to abbreviate that now. How do I abbreviate that? Well, I'm going to put on there, in the instructions, if I, I mean, nobody does this, but if you read the instructions to the form, it says to use the contract number right there. So I can say Volusia County decorative landmark sidewalk project, but I've also got to give the contract number. T1258, Z12, ABT, whatever. You're putting the contract number there. All right. In the local agency world, we usually use the, the FIN number, what we call the FIN number, the financial aid uh, identifier, financial identification number. We usually use that, but you need an identifier. It's numerical, and it's federal. Right? If I work for the county like we do for local agencies, they want to use a local agency number. No, no, no. This is federal. Right? But that's who we're reporting to. So always use the federal number. Right? Be consistent. Whatever number I use here, I'm going to use it all on every page out throughout the, 
the record here. Okay? I'm not going to use four different ones and no one's going to be able to match up anything. <laughs> all right? The date, all right? The important part here, the starting date of your payroll. Let's say, what's today's date? 27. 27th day of, what's the, what's the month? April. April. Am I done? No. What do I need to put? The year. Okay. Every time you put a date, you're putting the month, day, year. Month, day, year. That's the date in the DOT world, in the federal regulations. So we have to put the year on there too. Because a lot of times, remember, the date at the top is, is the date that I'm doing this. And I'm, I'm fixing a problem that happened a year ago. Uh-oh. I have to have a year on there, and no one's going to know when that week. They're going to think it was the same year. So I have to always be consistent and use the year along with my date. And then again, I'm going to repeat the contractor's name from above. Right. It's the same thing, because it says here um, that everybody's been fully paid, wages they've earned, that no rebates have been taken out. Right. And it's from the same company from the full weekly wages earned by any person that no deductions have been made either directly or indirectly. Right? And then notice here is a whole long list of regulations and it's saying that I have complied with those regulations. If, if I don't, if I use a form that's old, some of these regulations might not be there because they weren't even in the So you've got to make sure you're using a recent form <coughs> because you are responsible for every regulation that's there. Just listen there. These are lines in the middle here for your deductions. All right. We all take deductions. What's the major deduction everybody takes that we have to take? Federal, the, the FICA, right? All right. We have withholding taxes, things like that. We can list them all out here if we want to, but a lot of times it's easier to just put C, attached payroll. C, attached payroll. C, attached pay record. Um, something, but there has to be something in, these, in this section here that shows that you know that these deductions apply. Right. The section below that on that statement has a section here that's got um, information on apprentices. Then on four, it talks about fringe benefits. If there are fringe benefits associated with your project or on the payroll itself, which is uh, employees are paid wages and fringes, but my company pays those fringes to um, AFLAC, to a pension fund. I am going to say I'm going to put A up here. I'm going to put an X and A because my fringes are paid to a fund. Right? No one's going to see cash. The benefit will come to them later, right? We hope, <laughs> we hope that benefit is there for them. Then if I pay them cash, if I, my company's small, I don't have a 401k, I'm sorry, I won't offer that. I'm going to pay that fringe, if there's a fringe associated with, with a certain um, classification, that's going to get paid through cash. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. All right, on the other part, side is exceptions, all right? Say most of my people, all of them are, are paid um, into a fund, except my common laborers. I give them the, the fringes in cash. So then I would put that there. That's my exception. All I'm putting is classification, not putting a name. I don't want to single anybody out. It's just the classification, laborers, and then my explanation over here. All right. Now remember, when somebody's reviewing a payroll, they sometimes don't speak our language. They're sometimes from, you know, Seattle somewhere, and, and you know, <laughs> they don't understand. So my explanation can't be abbreviations, can't be, you know, jargon. It's got to be something that someone else, some accountant from some tower somewhere can make sense of, all right? We don't want to speak in jargon when we're talking about an explanation. Be as explicit as you want to. You can send me a line in there. You can even go down to the remarks if you want to. I don't care, you know? Tell a life story. I just want all the information I need to be able to know what you're doing. The remark section there, what are some things you can put in the remark section? Have some of you used that section? You can put the... The number of the work week, like this payroll number one, number two, number three. Good, that's a good place to put it. What else? Revised or supplemental, something that tells about more information about that payroll. Good. good. It's, oh, vital, that's a good one. Vital. Okay, hopefully there's only one of those on there. Have you seen those before? They keep talking vital, vital, oh no. So that's 
somebody made a template and didn't take it off. Um, so you got to make sure what's in the remarks is going to be important. And then um, the name again, same name that was up above, right under the date before, and then the, their signature. All right, the date and title. Again, if it's different than the one up above, it's wrong. It needs to be the same person served by it. It's not a tag team here. <laughs> one person is responsible. All right. And so, you can give a uh, certified digital signature or a true signature. All right. We deal with copies and emails. So sometimes, you know, I, I love these people who just give one little line. That's their signature, you know. That's fine, as long as you can see it. The more times you make a copy of it, it gets lighter and lighter. So just, re you know, remember, when you're looking at your, as a prime, when you're looking at your sub's paperwork, make sure that it's, you know, it's going to pass muster as it, as it gets copied and sent all over the place. Okay, we're happy. Everybody's happy, right? We got this down. We're cool. <laughs> and we're wise, aren't we? Uh-oh, now comes the good part, though, right? Because the statement of compliance is the easy part, right? Now comes the harder part when we're talking about the wages, okay? Um, you have to follow the form. Really, if you just follow the form, top to bottom, you're not going to forget anything that you have to re report and make sure it's accurate, all right? This is what the form looks like again. This is a DOT form, just because, you know, they want me to push the form. You know what I'm to say. Again, you don't have to use it, but it is available to you because, again, you have to follow along and use every column in every situation. All right, at the top, again, it has the header information, the project information. Again, use the same numbers. Don't start making up numbers, contract numbers. Don't change the project name. Oh, my goodness. You know, everything looks different from page to page. Let's be consistent. <coughs> then it's going to give you the section here. It's going to repeat the contract number. And then at the top here, in section four, in the, in the parentheses, the day of the week and the date. Again, I don't care if you start you know, Sunday to Saturday. I don't care if you start you know, Tuesday to Monday, as long as they're in order. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the date and then the day of the week as well. M, W, whatever, so you can abbreviate, all right? But we have to know, because sometimes we make mistakes, right? I'll put, you know, 31, 31. Oh, no, what did I do? What did I mean? Oh, one was Thursday, one was Friday. Yeah. So help yourself out there. Section eight is the deductions. Now, remember, there's two <coughs> open columns here. I get to put something there, don't I? And that avoids me having to take that extra time to make a, an extra sheet. So I can put them right here every time. Those are ones I use. Consistently, like I always, I'm using that. You know, this is a deduction that's that's on a lot of my, you know, as a prime that you know I use a lot. So I'm going to put those two there. The most prevalent, right? And then I'm going to have to use a deduction sheet, a separate sheet for any additional ones. Right. Okay. This is what it looks like again. I'm putting the name over there on the far left, and again it asks for the race and gender, along with your exemptions. The work classification goes there. Again, we talk about that, right? Classification. Can I just make that up? Labor who works on Mondays. <laughs> Can't do that, can I? Unless it's on the prevailing wage rate table. It's there. I can use it. Right. Here comes where you're going to put your hours, standard hours, overtime on top. Right. Standard hours, overtime on top. Remember that. Start mixing them up. Hopefully, hopefully we'll catch that in the first payroll if you do, you know, if you mix them up, okay? Because these, this right here is going to be time and a half, see? So you're going to mess with the formulas whenever you switch it around, if you're using this as an Excel, all right? And then over here, the pay rates are going to be in here. You can see wherever there's a zero, that's going to be automatic fill. Based on what you put into these numbers, that's going to change, all right? This down here doesn't have a zero in it because that is for the, down here, weekly. All right, that's for the weekly right here. And this we don't know yet until you put it in based on the classification and what you pay them, all right, what the pay rate is. So if you just use the form and go, you know, section by section, especially the very first time you do it. All right, now there's FICA, withholding, here it is, all the different sections. You can see it. If you're using the newest form, 
it will have a column 10. If you find that, that you're using a form that doesn't have a column 10, whoops, old form, old form. Right. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to tell you to use an old form, okay, because it's not as helpful. I'm not going to throw up the trash or anything like that. But I'm just going to tell you, you should always be using the latest form. This here helps. Why does it help to see the fringe number here? Let's say I, I um, $1.53 is my fringe. <coughs> Why does it help to have it on this page? Instead of having to go to a separate page to look for it. Yeah, because if you're using it to meet the wage, I'm an RCS, I'm looking at them and say, like, oh, there's a mistake, there's a mistake. And you have it here, I'm like, oh, I see the fringe. It goes with that together. Now I can see where they need to be. All right, we're just making it a little easier so that the review process is as quick as, as we can get it. The deduction sheet, there's a separate sheet. If you run over, you need more. All right, and again, if you're going to abbreviate, um, A, B, L, C, D, what is that? Don't make me ask questions, you know. Again, I haven't had the coffee yet. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, spell it out for me. So if there's something that you want to use little, you know, identifiers for, give me a legend or something. You know, I know, I know DOT world, we're all about, you know, our acronyms. But um, help me out here. I'm an RCS. I'm busy. You know, what is that? So give me a legend or something. And then here's the total that's going to come out here of deductions, right? Again, same way. You're going to use the same process at the top, the header. Again, make your template right, and you never have to go wrong. Same issues. We'll go quickly through here. The fringe benefit page is the same way. It has the same header, information, and then you're putting down your, your separate columns for each item. Again, your, your employee name, again, first and last. First and last. When we give you a payroll violation, we only use the, the first initial. But on everything else, you have to have that employee's name. First and last. Right. Can I ask a question? Sure. About the sure. Do you have a calculation in there to figure out the hourly rate? Yes, the calculation, yes. And we'll, we'll get to that here in a little bit. It's a good question because you definitely do. I have to be able to, to know your calculations, how you got to that. That amount, right? How does that help? Okay. Exactly. Good question. Good question. All right. Sure. Another one? Yeah. On the deduction form on your overtime, are you do you reduce anything over 40 or anything over 8? Does it matter whether it's weekly or hourly? Some people. Okay. Say that, say that loudly for everybody. Okay. Uh, my question was on the overtime. Is it anything over 40 hours or is it anything over a regular 8 hours? It's 40 hours. So it, it could mean that, yeah, on this on this job, I could only work overtime on this job because I worked all my others on another job. Okay. Or, you know, I could work 12 hours today and they're all standard. But we know that you you got credit somewhere else. Yes, okay. you are right. It doesn't have to um, compute that way. Right. Especially in our business, we, we, you know, we, our employees move around. And thank goodness we're good at, you know, checking that stuff. But, yeah, I'm not going to dig you on that. Um, 40 hour week. That's the reason you can send me the whole gross, uh, a weekly gross. All right. Um, does it apply to me? I'm an independent contractor. Do payrolls apply to me? Yes. I'm an independent contractor? Yes. I'm the cousin over here. She wants to hire me today. I'm independent. What does that mean? Being an independent contractor? Am I on a payroll? I have to have an FBID number. I can't be Cousin Joe just coming on the project with her because she wants me to come there. And I'm never going to be on the payroll. I'm just Cousin Joe. Uh, I'm on the project. As an employee, I have an FBID number. I'm now a contractor. I'm, right? That's why, you know, my husband likes to do a little on-the-side work. He got him an FBID number. So when he goes on a project, he's an independent contractor. That means nobody else has to take out taxes for him. But he's still on the project, right? He's on there because he has a sublet or a rental agreement. Again, like we talked earlier, no one gets on this project working unless they have a contractual agreement, something in writing, something that obligates them to the same rights and the same responsibilities that the prime has. All right, payrolls are going to show name, classification, 
and hours worked. Name, classification. Well, I'm a truck driver. I'm a dump truck driver. I'm a, what is it, one axle, two axle. We got all these different axles. All right, and the hours work. Then I work on the project. That's it. I'm going to tell you my wage. I'm going to tell that right now. Right, what if I am a working owner? I'm a working owner. Oh, I'm excluded. All right, do I still need to turn in the payroll? Yes. Yes. Yes, I do. Right, I'm going to submit a signed letter to the um, prime, to the, and then turn it into JRCS, that states that I am the owner of this business, which means I have 20% at least equity, and I participate in management. I'm not just Cousin Joe, I am 20% equity. I am somebody who has management as part of my company. I'm going to turn in a payroll, again, It shows name, ID number, and owner excluded. I'm also going to be there under a subhood or a rental agreement, right? I have to have a written agreement. Working for a person. I'm a working for a person. Right? I work for the Prime, I can work for the sub, I can work for the, you know, any labor company. I'm a working for a person. Right? They all listen to me, right? I get slightly more money than the rest of them, that's all I have. <laughs> payroll of the employer is where I'm going to be. I'm a working for a person. I'm going to be on their payroll, and I'll be marked as for a person, and then my classification. Right? I'm a grade all. I'm a, a paper. And all the other payroll data has got to be there. The hours, the rates, everything. All right? Everything's there. The only difference is that I have to be on the payroll and I have to be marked as a four person. When we interview people, we're going to find that out. All right? They're a four person. All right? Whenever the inspectors are going around making their daily work reports, they're putting down <laughs> who's a four person. If there's a four person there, a foreman, four person. And then how many skilled and unskilled laborers are there? We're tracking all that. Right? It's also going to be tracking the payroll. Okay? All right. So certified payrolls. Who is reported wrong? Here we have an owner excluded. We have a four person operator grade off, and we have an independent contractor back co operator. Who's wrong on that payroll? Who should not be there on that payroll? Sean, very good. Sean should not be there. Where should he be? On his own payroll. Very good. Oh, very good. Okay, he should be on his own payroll. With his own company name, his own name, whatever his FBI is. If it's, you know, Hefner Inc. or, you know, he put his own name, however he does it. He's got to be on his own payroll. Right? They, they've done it correctly with the information. They just shouldn't have him there. Right? Very good. Alright, so that was it. Now the wages can include, again, wages have can include hourly rates and fringe benefits. Right? We all know that. Now some of our, our wage prevailing wage rate tables are you know, not as many fringe benefits as there used to be. So they're getting away from that. They're uh, hyping up the hourly rates and yet the fringes are, are going away. But we still do have some that do have quite a bit of, you know, there'll be at least two or three on the wage wage great table has the, the fringe benefits. So we, we can get paid that way. Let's say we're a highway parking lot striping operator. On this figure payroll, base rate, eleven ninety four on that wage table. <coughs> 402 is their fringe. Right? If they have overtime, <coughs> what does time they have getting marked off of? Get re reported or calculated from? Seven ninety four, right? <laughs> if I work 41 hours, I work 41 hours, I have, I get that one hour at time and a half plus 402, right? Because I worked an hour, and this is for every hour I work, I get that. That's where we'll find out. We can kind of get in trouble sometimes. 15.96 is the total combined of the hourly wage for this example. All right, that's what. If they choose to, if they mark B on their certified payroll statement of compliance, they put B, we pay in wages, they're going to pay a wage of $15.96 per hour. Right. Overtime, 
Same, same scenario. Calculate is one and a half times the base, like you said. The fringe is paid for all the hours. All the hours. Again, not time and a half, just straight. All right. So they would get the time and a half is 17.91 plus the 402. We just talked about. All right. Know the rules. Classifications now. Deductions and fringe benefits. These are the three things we just talked about. We're going to go into more, little more depth as quickly as we can. All right. Classification for the wage rate table. Again, don't make up your own. Please don't. You know. I mean, it could be close. Again, use a legend or something if you have to. You know, keep it in the columns. You can stretch out columns. It's an Excel spreadsheet. You can, you know, you can stretch it or you can change the font size. Um, it fit it in there. I had one where the Excel spreadsheet of the form, it, it didn't pick up the word operator. So operator was always out of the screen. So when you printed it, you never saw it. So I'm like, violation. I'm like, no, 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 it's there, it's there. Okay, so sometimes you have to kind of check yourself before you turn something in. Because what it looks like to you on the screen you may not be able to print out the All right? <coughs> so in case your request may be needed once you look at your prevailing wage rate table and you say, oh my goodness, I don't have a test director. What am I going to do? All right? I'm going to, I'm going to create a request, and it's going to apply just to this project. If I'm doing a project down the way, it doesn't apply to that project. Only this one. I'd have to do two requests, wouldn't I, if I want to use them on both? All right, there's a new way to do that. There's a website you go to, the construction wage, and then you key in WRB. You click, you click that section where it says WRB. And that gets submitted by the prime. If the subs aren't going to do it, you're going to do it. It's the prime. They're going to hand it to you and say, hey, before they, they used to be able to do that, they could, they could turn it in. But now we want to go to the prime. You can report multiple classifications, right? I mean, yeah. sometimes we do. We work in multiple classifications. Well, we're so smart, right? I know how to do you know, bulldozer. I know how to do it. Great all. I can do the forklift. I can do it all. Sometimes I do. I have to be on a separate line. One way I can do it, separate line for classification. So if I'm working five hours on the forklift, three hours doing this other machine, and two hours the bulldozer, I can <coughs> separate it all out. All right? My superintendent loves that. <laughs> separate it all out. It's fine. Or you can choose on your payroll the way you report at the highest classification work. And the way you pay your individual choosing the highest classification they work. If the bulldozer is the highest and they did a lot of other things that were below that, you have to put the highest one up there. All right. <coughs> question, sir. My question when it comes to that, yep. if you're out doing a uh, labor review mm -hmm. and you uh, see the worker working in a lower classification yes. and to submit the certified payroll with them in the higher classification, yep. is there a compliance issue there? No. They, as long as they're paying at that higher wage, that, what, what the classification they're, they're putting on there, yes. They have to be paying at the highest rate. Now, if it was the other way around, if you saw them on a higher one and they were listing as labor when they're really doing you know, concrete finishing work, then you have an issue. But you're right. When they do this, <coughs> there may come a time where you're going to see them doing a lower item. It's not wrong. So you don't have wrong. to change your classification. For the lower. What's so that? You don't have to change it back to the lower. You can keep yeah. them at the highest classification. Yeah. You have to pay at the highest wage. Alright? If I'm gonna if I'm gonna work them in three different things and my and my bulldozer is the highest thing, I'm gonna pay it that at the bulldozer rate. <laughs> and they may get on other equipment. But as long as the bulldozer is the highest rate, that's what they're being paid. And that's what they saw me at when they interviewed me or when they um, saw me later. You see me on the forklift, which isn't as much, but it's not wrong. Right. And I know I had one prime who told me not too long ago, they said we separated out because when there's a labor interview, there's issues. Well, the only issue is if you're paying at a lower rate. As long as you list the highest one. One question. And that's not a change. That's been in effect for a long time. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understand. Go right if you're listing them out of each piece of equipment they're on, mm -hmm. 
and the one that you have to pay the lower rates on the lower machine. It's, it's, yeah. Those are minimums. So if you want to pay them at that minimum rate when they're on a fork, let's say, yeah. you want to pay them at that lower rate. Okay. So they would be two hours then, you know, three hours on this other one. Again, if you go over the amount of time, and you just yeah, you need a required wage rate for each one. You're okay. You can, yes. You have to be at least above the minimum. Again, those are minimums on that prevailing wage rate. You are welcome to pay above that. <laughs> Very welcome to pay above that rate, okay? To be competitive, you may have to be. But, um, but yes, you can break it down. You would have the hours listed that they work on each, of, each set of equipment. You know, and in that way. you have at that Yes, There's different sets of equipment, and you pay them per that way trade for each yes. line yeah, item, yeah. then you're good, yeah. yes. including like OJT, and, right? Yes, if there were okay. a trade right. that you would have to put the word trade on there, and he'll talk about that. I don't think you quite heard her question correctly. It is a requirement to classify people properly. On the payroll. You can pay them the higher rate, but they must be classified properly. But they can be classified at the highest rate, using the highest classification on the payroll. You're saying that they should put, you're saying that right now you have it to where you can do it either way. You can separate it out line by line, or you can pay at the highest rate. You can pay the highest rate, but we should be classifying our people as to what they're doing. That's, that's what she's asking. If yeah, you go on a labor interview and you're you're seeing them perform. Okay, what well, you can do that on your on your um, payroll. You can put everything that they're doing. You can put if you want to put the three different classifications that they're doing. But you don't have to. You can just put the highest. One. According according to what's what we're doing now. Yes, that's. I'm classification sorry. has to always be the highest though. You can't put laborer and it has to be the highest. Let me see if I can. Actually, let me see I if I can phrase it. You're contradicting each other. You're contradicting one another. Yeah. So, okay. My question is, and how it reads, is that it should be separated. That we are have to separate a laborer from a mechanic in the hours. And so that's what it reads. So, but you're saying we can pay at the mechanic rate and they can perform a laborer's job. And, and be classified as yes. a laborer, but paid at that higher rate. Yes. Okay. See, that's you got to change the classification. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he's saying. Yeah. yeah, so, okay. so and, 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 and understand the, okay. the I won't say confusion, but, but the, the, the dilemma here is, okay. let's say they're a, they're an equipment operator and paid paid 15 bucks an hour, and then they're a grade checker paid 13 bucks an hour. Right. Well, you can classify them as a grade checker and pay them 15 bucks an hour, and that will suffice. So you, but you're okay. paying at that higher rate. Right. Was, you you mean, don't have to change the rates between the grade checker. Separate them out. Yeah, you don't, you no, also, you don't. just to clarify that. You might be paying them okay, but if they're observed at that higher classification, they need to be reported at that higher well, yeah, classification. Yeah. The highest, yeah. Yeah. It's not just a function of coverage to pay, it's no. so a reporting yeah. right. What are they doing? And I understand that. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll gather it around understand is that well, look, there's another screen. If we have two classifications, and this is where we're getting, this is where I think we're talking wrong with Lane, is that we have two classifications. Mm -hmm. I'm working as a paver operator and I'm working as a laborer. From what I'm understanding from you, I can just be a paver operator all day long. And but if I'm observed doing observed doing laboring function, I need to be classified as a laborer and a paver. We don't have to. No. Okay, so that's where if they're paid at the highest classification and wage. Yes. Yes. You can choose to. Some some contractors choose to pay yes. the fifteen ninety six, okay. and then they'll list out a different line item for the different hours they work. You can do that. Right. Okay. But no, you don't. Okay. It's not wrong if you if you list them at the highest classification. <laughs> Okay. Right. Now, when we get into trouble is when we do the other, when you, you know, when they're working in more, if they work for any amount of time that they're being, you know, labor interviews and observe on a piece of equipment, then you're, for that day and that time, they have to pay for that equipment minimum wage. Again, these are minimums. 
We can be paying higher. Nana, you have a question? Well, I was just going to say, if you have, a, like, your example of paper operator and the laborer, if you put them down as a laborer and still pay them as a paper operator and we, we see them as a paper operator, you don't get a payroll violation because they're improperly classed. So just be aware.